has someone to speak for him since something crisis-like came up, as it tends to do these days, we all know. So we have each of us at about 20 minutes, and then uh, the four of us having a conversation, a discussion amongst ourselves. So listen carefully, all of us, to each other, because we want to have this conversation for the last part of this. And then again, with the three by five cards, if you could write your questions there, and that'll, that'll be four to five at that ending wrap up. So, that come on, and to so our technical help. The computer has. It was on Vine and then it went off. I have this. I didn't need this to move. I need this to go on, Brendan. The projector is not. The projector. It's the projector that went off. Okay. Okay, while he's getting this on, think of this. For thousands of years, trillions of these human brain cells, trillions of brain cells for thousands of years have been thinking, scheming, and dreaming about how to grab land and resources from other human beings. This has been the human condition. Win, lose. How can my side win and that other side's not of God? So they gotta lose, God's on my side. So that's sort of how it's been. But every now and then through the ages, we'll say four to 5,000 years at least, there's been this light come forward where instead of us versus them, it becomes all of us together. It's become a society where we all realize there's a consciousness here as we, as we know. There's been enough elevated consciousness for the human beings living in at least that region to have realized we're all in this together and there's only one land that we have and we must fairly share it because we're tired of the bloody wars. So until we get this, I'm just going to go through it without the pictures. I was all working a few minutes ago. So this is called the golden thread of perennial wisdom teachings on land. Push it forward, push down. Economic principles in the Vedic. We're going to go through ancient four or five thousand years ago Vedic India. We're going to go to the Middle East. We're going to go to China back home here to Henry George, of course, and I'm gonna do it all in 20 minutes, 5,000 years. <laughs> Nicholas Kazanis <laughs> is a Greek-born Georgia scholar of Vedic history, Indology, and the culture in the Indus Valley back to 5,000 years ago. Moving me forward. Stop, stop, Nate, stop. And then, uh, yeah, I can't even read it off here now. The we were just in the slideshow and it wasn't showing you The study, his book, Vedic Teachings, Economic Teachings in the Veda, deals with principles as found in these ancient sources and principles as uh, unchanging, an unchanging and eternal quality. Page down, I hope. The work of wise law givers in the remote antiquity of the Vedic period shows the same concern about the distribution of wealth that occupies the mind of modern economists. The ancient Indian codes, these sages instituted their laws. They fully realized the bodily needs for wholeness, food, shelter, locomotion, assembly, property, peace, physical work, and spiritual development. You might say they were holistic. The Vedas and land value taxation, a most surprising feature, is the principle of free access to land for all and the land value tax, which should be the source of government revenue. It's surprising because land value taxation is supposed to be a fairly modern concept. There is a concept of rent or surplus, a higher charge on the more fertile areas. That's all from his book. So we see these basic principles, land tenure in the Vedic age. The, the land is divine entity, it belongs to the whole of mankind, belongs to all men equally. The whole community holds the region where it lives. And yet land is cultivated by individuals or families, not jointly, by um, the community. And it brings us back to the sentiment in our Leviticus and our biblical, and that is inscribed on our Liberty Bell. 
proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. Which brings us to the Middle East and the early Christian land ethic, which echoed the Old Testament teachings, those old Levitical teachings. The land must not be sold beyond reclaim. The land is mine. You're but strangers resident with me. Dr. Dossey read that this morning. The prophet of the earth is for all. Ecclesiastes. Isaiah, woe unto them. Charles read this one. That join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place for anyone else. And Nehemiah, restore, I pray you, to them even this day their lands, their vineyards, their olive yards, and their houses. So land tenure described uh, in, in, in Leviticus, those with poorer land were to be given more acreage, those with more fertile land would be given less. But what about land locations regarding the marketplace? Now this is, might be kind of pretty interesting if you haven't come across it yet. It's from the land question in the Talmud from a few decades ago, Solomon Salas Cohen is, is from uh, the Gemara, Bala, Batra, and so the rabbis are thinking, well, upon the more valuable land holdings was to be imposed a tax or lease fee, the measure of which was the excess of their value over a given standard. The fund created was to be paid out in due proportions to those holding lands in less favorable locations. This is, they were trying to figure out, well, we've divided up the land by land soil quality. What about some will be living closer to the market, Jerusalem usually, and others will be further out. They're at a disadvantage. How do you make labor's access to land fair when you have locational disadvantage like that? So as for that, the adjustment to be made by money, that is to say those holding land nearer the city, Jerusalem usually should pay into the common treasury the estimated excess value pertaining to it by reason of the superior location situation, while those holding land of less value by reason of its distance from the city was received from the treasury and money compensation. Doesn't that sound pretty similar to what we're talking about? Do you think so? In this, we see affirmed the doctrine that natural advantages are common property and not, may not be diverted to private gain. So the land ethic, early Christian communities, as Charles talked this morning, koinonia, meaning essentially that God was the sole earner of the earth, given for the, and he pronounced it better than I knew how previously, I think etokia, the self-reliant livelihood of all. So, now this, I'm going to see how my time's even doing, kind of dip. I think I'm doing okay. Do I have 15 minutes left still? Fairly quickly, through a, a, a very interesting presentation given by Peter Bauman in 2013 at our International Union for Land Value Tax Conference in London. And he had done a very substantive survey of the 4,000 years of taxing the land in China. Does it mean they taxed it in China for 4,000 years? Through all these dynasties, which were not the same land uh, boundaries, of course, as modern China, but it's that region we're talking about. These uh, several dynasties, and that gives a time zone in relation to the West, ancient Greece, Rome, medieval Renaissance, uh, and up pretty much to our present day. You see all those different dynasties had, had different land boundaries, but it was all in that region. So what you can see here, and this is going to be a brief touch, is the rise and fall of civilization based on land tenure. When the land was fairly shared, you had the peace and harmonic situation. When a few grabbed more, you had the downfall, downfall of the dynasty. In order to have real power through uh, acknowledgement of a new regime, that regime would often come to, again, a fair land distribution or some method of doing that so that the people would respect the new power structure. Sometimes that's how it worked. And you'll see kind of some details here. So Xia Dynasty, now 2100 to 1600 BCE, the land was distributed following the Great Flood. Uh, Peter is looking at lessons learned from each of these dynasties. So this is the land belongs to the people at large. Uh, Shang Dynasty, this looks a little like tic-tac-toe. Maybe it came from this. This was, in this dynasty, you had this roughly sized pattern where you had, the, in the purple, the private land tenure. Equal size of, this is looking agriculture. And then you had a plot in the middle that was the common plot that they would then share in the taking care of, share in the growing of the crops in that common plot. And maybe that blue was like a, 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 shed, a tool shed that they would all share something in common, some capital. Could be the blue, a building or something. 
But then that green spot is what they then use for their common needs. So not like a land value tax, but it's still a method of fairly sharing so that the individual balance with those common needs of the community. So lesson, the best method of public revenue is when you don't appropriate what people regard as their private property. Xiao Dynasty, land allocated for use. Penalties for not using allocated land. Amount of land allocated depends on fertility and public revenue divided into first gift, then aid. I don't understand all that part myself, but there's a requirement to provide produce and military equipment into the commons. Progressive taxation of feudal chiefs. Um, lesson three, the basis of allocation on land should be use. If it's not used, it's liable to be reclaimed and otherwise used. Han Dynasty, private ownership of, of land. The rich own thousands of Mao, while the poor have not even enough land to stand on. So in this one is when the powerful landowners influence the government. The two sources of production are labor and land. And in order that all land capable of producing crops might be cultivated and all hands, on all hands engaged in agricultural use, taxes on land should be abolished. Now what this is the corruption. This is the rationale of the big landowners for taxing production on, on them. And they're actually using the argument for we would use for taxing land. They're using it against them. They're saying, don't tax us, it's limiting our productivity. So, with Han Dynasty, those low taxes on land, tenants paying higher rent, the poll tax. So lesson four, there will not be an effective land tax when there's unrestrained private ownership of land. I think we know that. Tang Dynasty. That's just showing the rough uh, footprint of that dynasty. Uh, Yang Yun tax reforms, summer and autumn levy. People were not taxed according to their age, which at times they were taxed according to their age, but according to their wealth or the amount of land possessed. Lesson six, a tax on land better than a tax on people. And then order was restored, distribution of land reestablished. Tang Dynasty, lesson five, it's possible to move back from unrestrained private ownership to government allocation of land. Ming Dynasty, it was effective, but the tax roll became obsolete. They started taxing other things, additional levies. Uh, Song Dynasty, source of public revenue, rent from public land, farm rents, urban rents, poll tax, and other taxes. Uh, King Dynasty, uh, I'm going to kind of move along. I want to make sure I get to the other parts. Lesson seven, an effective land tax needs regular updating of land values. Gee, that sounds pretty much like us, I think. That was a long time ago. Uh, okay, Sun Yat Sun, considered the father of modern China, the teachings of Henry George will be the basis of our program of reform. The land tax as the only means of supporting the government is an infinitely just, reasonable, and equitable distributed tax, and on it we will found our new system. I, we don't think he studied 4,000 years of China and land tenure to get to this. What he was finding out about was a province, an area in China that had been settled by German military people who were Georgists, and they began a Georgist land value tax system in that area of China, which was really taking off, was bringing a lot of notice in its, in its uh, 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 development and, and, and moving towards out of the very rural uh, development situation, really moving ahead. So he heard about that, and then he got into that, and that's how he heard about Henry George and Red Progress and Poverty. So look how it loops around the world. You're going to see even more looping with the physiocrats, as we know, uh, considered uh, the founders of uh, modern economics and the philosopher, me medical uh, doctors, advisors to the kings of France. And so we always assume when Adam Smith came with his tutor to Paris to study with the physiocrats, somehow these, these smart men had studied the wealth flows in France and they had come to the realization that you should have the single tax on land. Isn't that what we usually thought about the physiocrats? I know I did. So they coined the phrase, impose unique single tax, urged the French kings to levy taxes on land instead of labor. And one of the Enlightenment's wise men, Mirabeau the Elder, held their discovery would be if enacted a social advance 
equal to the inventions of writing and money. But here's the interesting part. Where did the idea come from? Kisne is known for his writings on Chinese politics and society. Because of an admiration of Confucianism, Kisne's followers bestowed him with the title Confucius of Europe. Many tax principles put forth by him and other physiocrats were divide, derived from land and tax policies of the dynasties of China. And I came across a paper just a few months ago. It's the writings by Tan Ni. Can't give you the URL right now. But uh, does details all these tax policies that the physiocrats put forth uh, exactly how they got them from ancient China. How many do that? <laughs> so, what? All right, we're here. Eight, eight more slides and seven more minutes. Adam Smith wrote in his classic Wealth of Nations that both ground rent and the ordinary rent of land are a species of revenue which the owner in many cases enjoys without any care or attention of his own. Ground rent seem, in this respect, a more proper subject of peculiar taxation. Really a different use of the term peculiar. It really meant, in his time, more special taxation. Nothing can be more reasonable than that a fund which owes its existence to the good government of the state should be taxed peculiarly. So, we... The, many writings that more that, that Adam Smith was onto it, but he had certain patrons that he shouldn't talk too loud about the land problem. So now we're going to Karl Marx. We're going to the Communist Manifesto. Some of you are not going to like that at all. <laughs> but we have to see because some of us are very committed to moving forward, forward center, beyond the old right and the old left, which is tearing our country apart just ripping us up, this right-left divide, Republican-Democrat. And so we really need to show there is a kernel of great wisdom that is on both sides from their major spokespeople. So much so that the first point of the Communist Manifesto is the abolition of property and land and application of all rents of land to public purpose. Now, we know that you can take the seed and leave the kernel. We don't have to nationalize land. We know the te technique of how you just simply take the rent and allow the private property and land, private use rights, and all the benefits of that, but you extract the community-created land rent. So what a great thing to say, hey, you guys coming from the left, and most all left, you're gonna pretty much trace back to the communist ideas, have them really look at this and have a discussion based on number one. Now, <laughs> I couldn't resist, I'm sorry, uh, to put these two guys in the same slide. <laughs> Milton Friedman, land should be taxed as much as possible and improvements as little as possible, and Carl. And as you might know, but he really got to the land problem in his Das Kapital Part 3. There's wonderful juicy quotes. He has extensive writings on ground rent. And he really was starting to see, and he writes this, that it's really the land problem that if the land problem is solved, you can have a monopoly capitalism that that's the primary problem. But I've been to conferences with Marxist scholars on the podium, and I've mentioned part three of Das Kapital, and quoted, and you've never seen such blank stares in your life as these Marxist scholars, and no clue about this part. I think Karl Marx was not a Marxist by the time he got to part three. I've heard part three before part one. Rent is attacked, rent is extracted by the landowner Maybe I should read from here. Despite the palpable and complete passiveness of the owner, whose sole activity consists of in exploiting the progress of social development, towards which he risks nothing, and for which he contributes nothing, and for which he risks nothing, unlike the industrial capitalist. How about that? Wonderful quote from George. It's not enough that men should vote, not enough that they be theoretically equal before the law. They must have liberty to avail themselves of the opportunities and means of life. They must stand on equal terms with reference to the bounty of nature. We must make land common property. And the um, specifics of what that means, I love this part of our International Declaration on Individual and Common Rights to the Earth, which states, the exercise of both common and individual rights in land 
is essential to a society based on justice. But the rights of individuals in natural resources are limited by the just rights of a community. Denying the existence of common rights in land creates a condition of society wherein the exercise of individual <coughs> rights becomes impossible for the great mass of people. Is that not true today? This was written 50, 60 years ago when the IU was founded. And clap it. <laughs> clap it at the truth. So we have the emergent commons movement. Once more, again, the perennial wisdom teachings get back, understand the commons. Uh, a wonderful bridging work to be done in our future with the commons movement and our policy solutions in terms of tax and public finance. But I wanted to draw attention to this from Global Commons Trust. James Quilligan, who's acknowledged leader in the Commons Thinking uh, website. Our Commons are the collective heritage of humanity, the shared resources of nature and society that we inherit, create, and use. People across the world are now rediscovering these common goods and choosing to protect them for future generations. We had an Eleanor Ostrom talk uh, just yesterday, and she uh, received the Nobel Prize in Economics for her work on the Commons. So the equal right of all men and women to the use of land is as clear as their equal right to breathe the air. It is a right proclaimed by the fact of their existence. For we cannot suppose that some men and women have a right to be in this world and others do not. So here is the fundamental earth wisdom and earth rights wisdom. To enable thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in Heaven. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Alana. Um, so the topic, in, in case you were wondering, of this afternoon session is human rights and land rights. And all of the speakers are going to be focusing on that sort of sub-theme within that um, general topic. So our next speaker is a, is a stand-in for the Reverend Dr. Herbert Brown. And the topic is something to do with uh, land rights and food. And I don't have a bio for um, Reverend Daryl Harris, so I'll let him introduce himself. Okay, hi. Um, my name is, is Daryl Harris. Uh, as a way of introduction, I am a uh, licensed and ordained in the American Baptist Church. I uh, am a PhD student at Johns Hopkins. I'm a graduate of uh, Duke University Divinity School. Um, I pastor, I'm a pastor elect of a church called Newborn Community of Faith um, Church. It's in the west side of Baltimore in Sandtown. Sandtown was made famous by that's the neighborhood that Freddie Gray, who was uh, killed in police custody, was from. Um, so the neighborhood's been made famous through the infamous uh, activities surrounding Freddie Gray's death. Uh, so I'm, I'm pastor elect of a church there. I run a program out of Johns Hopkins Center for Little for Future called the Baltimore Food and Faith Project. And I'm a co-founder of the Black Church Food Security Network. So I'm filling in for Heber Brown, who is the leader of the Black Church Food Security Network. Um, so I'm supposed to talk about food and ethics and land and people. And one of the big challenges um, that we have here in Baltimore is frankly that the people are dying. So if you live in a neighborhood where I pastor, the average life expectancy is around 62, 62.5 uh, if you live across the street little better. Um, but if you live in cross country, uh, which is a, a, a well-to-do, uh, about 95% uh, white neighborhood in Baltimore, if you live in Roland Park, if you live in a few of the other affluent neighborhoods in Baltimore City, you can expect to live um, somewhere around 83, 84. So we're talking the same city, we're talking 20 year life expectancy difference, and the major thing killing people in, uh, in, in the neighborhood where I, where I pastor 
is uh, food-related deaths, right? diet-related deaths. It's going to be hypertension. It's going to be strokes. It's going to be um, some certain cancers. Um, and so these are, these are taking the lives uh, of, frankly, of, of my people, of our people. Um, so it's an issue. And our people are dying from it. We're dying from a lack of knowledge. Um, lack of knowledge around food because we are consuming food that uh, we didn't choose. We're consuming food that was given. And in large part, in America, in our, in our, given our American food system, no matter whether you're wealthy or you are impoverished, in large part, you're consuming food that's given. Because if I go to Whole Foods or if I shop at my local grocer, if the price of meat or the price of rice or the price of whatever goes up a dollar, I don't, I'm not in part of that, I'm not a part of that decision. Um, I just, I'm just a consumer. And whatever Whole Foods sells me or whatever my grocer sells me is what is available to me. I don't really have a, have a say in the matter. And so when, uh, when, when food producers decided that they wanted to gene genetically modify salmon, and not only did they want to genetically modify salmon so that the, fam the salmon is taking too long to grow and mature, right, like naturally. So they wanted to have it uh, done uh, twice as fast, so they genetically modified it. And so not only did most people, like 99% of the population, not even know about it and have a say in the fact that, there's, um, that the salmon was going to be genetically modified, but they didn't have a say that it wasn't going to be labeled. They didn't have a say that it was going to be distributed with ordinary, naturally recurring salmon such that the offspring in a few generations, you won't be able to tell the difference. Um, so you're just going to consume it. So you don't really have, so no matter who you are in America, in large part, the food we're consuming, you don't really have, uh, um, you don't have a lot of influence over it. There's some, you know, you're making some choices, but there's some larger things that are happening um, without your approval. Um, but that is exaggerated, it's exacerbated in, frankly, the American ghetto in places of concentrated poverty in America. So if you come to the neighborhood where I pastor, Sandtown, Winchester, or Upton, um, there's no grocery store there. So if I want to eat, what I end up eating is takeout, uh, carryout. So the famous Baltimore food is the chicken box, right? four wings and fries. Uh, but if I eat that for lunch and dinner, on most days. You can imagine what that does to my heart, right? You can imagine what that does even to my brain. Um, if I'm eating cheesesteak and I'm eating outside the house constantly, some people do it for three meals a day, they're eating outside the house. Um, so if you do this, um, because there's no grocery store and because there's uh, a, a, a low, I'm, I'm, the term is escaping me, but the, the number of people who have automobiles are greater than 30%. So the large swath of people who don't have cars. Um, so they can't get to the grocery store that's in the other neighborhood. Um, so they end up eating carry out. And then so um, we have all these issues and people die 20 years longer than their fellow citizens who are a couple miles up the street. Um, so this is a huge problem. And now we're ministers of the gospel and we are here to meet the needs of the people, and we're discovering that our people are always sick, and to say that they die at 63 is not to say that you're healthy until 63 and then you drop off the earth, right? It's to say that you're having issues, people start, most people start having cardiovascular challenges somewhere in their 30s, and then it worsens and worsens and worsens until at 63 they finally uh, expire, right? So it's, it's not to say that, um, so it's an it's, it's a it's a issue that starts quite, quite early. So through, a, through that 30-year through that period where you're dealing with issues around health, um, the quality of life is diminished. Productivity is diminished. Uh, ability to share and to help raise your children is, is diminished. Um, so now, what are we going to do about that? So there's a, there's a, there's, I'm a public health professional. And as a public health professional, uh, the first thing that most, most of us think we want to do is we want to communicate. We want to do a campaign, right? We want to teach people how to eat healthy. We want to encourage them to make healthy decisions. We want to um, 
somehow make make uh, healthy food available to in areas where it is not. But frankly, it's not enough. Uh, the amount of people who are able and willing to change their diet drastically um, through campaigns and public health efforts efforts is is, is minuscule. It's minuscule. Um, so, so what can we do? And frankly, what we need is a, a, a new imagination. We need, we need like a new person, a person who's not oriented to in the way that we've been kind of trained in the last, over the last 40 years. And one of the ways in which we, we're trying to accomplish this is through land, is through farming, is through having the people in our various churches, the people who are in the uh, Black Church Food Security Network, to have people who are in our various churches um, participate and become owners of the food that they are eventually going to consume. And so, and so um, when you when when I, when I think about land and I think about scripture, you know, I'm a, I'm a minister, so we, I'm always preaching, and then also always need a text every time I preach. And so, there's a text in the Old Testament that um, that it's, it's it's a text that 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 is used to introduce. Jezebel, when she, uh, along with her husband Ahab, takes Naboth's garden. So Naboth is uh, a village man. He has a nice garden that's beautiful and plush, but it happens to be next door to the king's land. And the king wants the land. Uh, so he goes and tries to negotiate with Naboth. And Naboth says, I, I can't give it to you. This is my lineage that has been given to me from my ancestors. I'm going to pass it on to my children, so he refuses, refuses to sell it. And then Jezebel comes um, and plots and kills him, essentially, and takes the land from him, and then gives it to her husband, Ahab. And then Ahab takes the land happily, and he enjoys a nice garden, and um, life goes on happily for Ahab and Jezebel. Um, but what happens to Naboth's children? The scripture doesn't tell us exactly what happens to their children. Uh, we're left to imagine it. You're left to imagine a family that is that is, is forced to get by and to make, make ends meet without land. And us who are working, living in impoverished areas are, are, are forced to do the same thing. We're living in neighborhoods that we didn't design, that uh, frankly were uh, organized to in the words of Karl Marx, um, in the world of, to commodify us, right? They were they were organized to 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 extract our gifts and to have us um, kind of produce as much as we can, but extract our gifts. It wasn't you know usually when a neighborhood is created, the neighborhood is created for people to thrive, for people to to do well and to have all the experiences of life. That's not how the ghetto was created, right? That's not how the the ghetto was imagined. The ghetto was imagined as a place where people can survive, maybe, um, but still have their gifts extracted from them. So this is where we're living, not in a place where land is there, we're being creative, where we are uh, being imaginative with the land, where we are being good stewards of the land, but we're put in a place where we have very little power over the land and our gifts are being extracted. And frankly, even those who are, who are deemed successful by, by, by uh, conventional standards haven't really become free from that mindset, but they've been, they've become better commodities, and therefore they receive a better salary. Um, but they're still bound in the sense that they don't control what they eat, they don't control what they put in their body, and therefore, even if, I went to, even if I'm from that neighborhood, and I grow up there and I move somewhere else, I still have a lot of the same tendencies. Um, and my life is short, and not as, ex not as extremely, but it is still short. So all that being said, Long story short, what we're trying to do is to re grab is to grab some ownership of the land. And our ownership is such a, a, a poor word, but that's the only way, that's the only English word that I know within our social economic system that says that we have access to this land and we can do to it what's in our best interest. The only way that we can we have a system to imagine doing that is to really to own it. And so we've taken ownership, stewardship over some swaths of land, and we're using that land to grow. And we're using that land to preach. 
and we're using that land to teach the people in our churches what the land is for, what God and how God how did God intend it? Um, what does all the agricultural texts in the Old Testament? What does that What does that mean? What do they mean? Right. So we're using the land as a, as, a, as a means of study, and as a means of growth, and ultimately as, as a means of health, so that we don't have to die 20 years younger than we ought to. Um, and in Baltimore City, there's one great farm. It's a farm called Strip to Love Two Farm. It's in Sandtown, Winchester. It's on the west side of Baltimore, if you're familiar. It's between Monroe and uh, Fulton, on uh, Lorman and Cavanaugh Street. Um, they have 16 hoop houses. They grow food, sell it in the neighborhood, also sell it in the farmer's market, um, put it on a mobile truck, and they go around neighborhoods that are marginalized and sell it to people in marginalized neighborhoods. But they also teach people how to farm and teach people how to reimagine the land and reimagine um, food and how they should consume it and how it should be grown and how it is, in fact, a, a, a life source. So I think my time is up. Five minutes. I still have five minutes. Yeah. Question. Okay. Question, your, your church has taken possession of the land, uh, Reverend Harrison. How has it done that? So really what we have is a, we have a lease. So we have a lease through the city. So the city, so, we, so we, we're still not owners, right? So that's a challenge. But the city in Baltimore, there's, there's lots of vacant land. So the city gave us, um, they knocked down a row of houses, and they gave us the land for, for one dollar. <coughs> so we have an acre and a half for the cost of a dollar. And we, spend, we pay $120 for water Whoa. a year. <laughs> Do you know the history or have seen the film of the L.A. farm, which was the largest urban farm in the United States, and what politically has happened with that whole situation over time? I'm not familiar with it. Oh, definitely. I think it's called... Does anybody know about L.A. farm, the urban, the largest <coughs> urban farm? Uh, garden. Uh, it was huge. Uh, anyway, there's a film. I'll get you the name of it. It's really a lesson to be learned about the leasing of the land from the city over 20, 30 years. Um, and you, I, I'll connect you with that group because yeah. they've been fighting and so there's been a transformation. But eventually it's very important to have you know, take over that lease. Exactly, because the yeah. city is going to take it back at some point. They're going to give it to and a developer, what, and they're going to yeah. build a nice so condo. In LA, yeah, this has been a huge national fight, um, and so it's a really good lesson to be learned, and the people to connect with. Yeah, yeah so there's a consorted effort of people. It's a group called the Faithlands Group. So there's a consorted effort for churches that have, there's some churches that have large amounts of land mm -hmm. to make that land available so that um, marginalized groups, frankly, black churches, can take can put that land into a, a land trust and take over that land so that we can have land instead of leasing land from the city that will uh, work with us as long as it's in their best interest. Can we visit your farm? Sure, you can come to Strength to Love Two Farm. I mean, I'm not sure how much time you have on your hands. Um, this evening, can we come this evening? Um, you can drive by. <laughs> I, I'm not going to be there this evening. Uh, most of the by the by three o'clock, the farm workers are gone, okay. so you can you can drive by this evening if you would like. But um, you know, there's not going to be someone there to give you a formal tour. And how far? How far from here? It's like 1800 block of Lorman Street. Um, so from here to Inner Harbor, same distance? No, it's like here to the Inner Harbor, back and forth about three times. Yeah. So if you, fair it's enough. on. Yeah. The, yeah, yeah, it's, in, it's in West Baltimore. Yeah. It's in West Baltimore. Actually, I mean, maybe if we, I, I, I have a meeting that is going to end around six thirty, and then at six thirty, if people wanted to see the farm, if there was a group, then I could meet people at the farm and then give you a short tour. Or you can pick us up. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, we'll I'm of, I'm of limited resources, my friend. I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll meet you there. Okay. <laughs> The address, please. South Central. Okay. 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 Okay.
is my time. So, but before I, leave, I do want to plug a film that we do have this this for Baltimore. We have a film called Baltimore Strange Fruit. It's put together by Eric Jackson and the Black Guild Institute. It's a fantastic farm that talks about um, the challenges nationally around, frankly, like black people and food issues, but then it narrows in on Baltimore and it kind of tells a, a local Baltimore story. So that's a great documentary if you would like to view it also. What's the name again? It's called Baltimore Strange Fruit. I just wanted to mention that may not know that it's genetically modified Salmon is made calf with eel on farms. So buy your salmon wild caught. Yeah, but eventually it's going to mix in even with the wild caught ones, right? Yeah. It's only farm, so you got about another year or so to eat your wild caught salmon, of course. <laughs> Part deal. 6.30. Thank you. Uh Moderator, I feel obliged to remind everyone to please write your questions on these these cards, right? And after the panel discussion, you will we'll read the questions from the cards, so you'll have a chance to ask all of your questions um, at the end rather than after each person's presentation. Um, okay. Our next speaker is uh, Dr. Kizia Gonzalez, who is trained as a medical doctor in Brazil and practiced medicine in Honduras before moving to the United States in 1989. She is Vice President for Honduras for the International Union for Land Value Taxation, this is part of the IU, and also the IU's main non-governmental organization representative to the United Nations holding consultancy status with the UN's Economic mm -hmm. and Social Council. She has worked extensively in the field of education and is active in the, forgive my pronunciation, uh, Proyecto de los trabajadores latinoamericanos, <laughs> I studied French, <laughs> um, advocating for fair wages and immigration reform. An educator and advocate for Georgia's economics, Dr. Gonzalez has a major focus on land rights for her fellow indigenous Garfuna, Gar Garfuna people. And her talk is gonna be on land rights and indigenous people. that definitely there is no accident. I apologize, Alana, for this back and forth, who goes forth, but my computer got locked off. And then I realized it's not an accident because I'm not the person much of a protocol. I want to touch the heart of everyone. And the only way to do that is if we come naturally. And uh, I was asked to speak about indigenous people and the land question. But obviously, all we have to do also with the general title of our presentation over here, which is ethic and mor moral, morality. Uh, a few days ago, a friend of mine wrote me a little quote he's made up and he's told me why is people do not like to speak about ethics and morals why is that it feels like we are ashamed of that and my answer was maybe because when we talk to first we have to separate what means each one in the dictionary the definition is interchangeable they said almost uh, synonymous. It's a code of principles, uh, rules by why those that we really operate as an individual. Maybe the reason is because uh, they are not in force because the only way to be moral, which is the way that we can move around the whole society is enforcing the code of rules from within ourselves. 
that individual has to develop their own set of rules of ethics. Then uh, the other important things that directly connected with moral and ethics is the uh, notion of uh, property. We're talking about rights and property, and that has been an issue very important to differentiate also. How we do that? Uh, it's not a makeup, but coming back again to our conversation, it's about Christianity and the what they did uh, among uh, about the land and the use of the land and from where people derive the land rights. For me, it's easy to go around establishing that those differences because us human beings uh, were the last creation or the last element that searched in this planet. If anyone over here can tell me contrary, just please let me know because I really want to always speak what is obvious for the majority and valid, valid for everyone. But there is two ways to interpret and to um, take side. One, or either we believe in the creationist theory that there is a God that has created everything, and the other one is result of the Big Bang or the Big Explosion, or whatever you want to understand or think or believe is up to each of you and me, but we cannot go further of that limit of our understanding and presumption. So why bother uh, questioning and discussing if his God is a atheist? I do not believe in God, and didn't change the reality of the human being that we are mortals. We come naked to this world and we barely go with some piece of clothing because uh, human beings came at last, and that is in the Bible. In the beginning, God created uh, the sky and the, and the land, and it was until the uh, last day, sixth day, that he after looking of everything that he had created, he realizes he needs somebody who was going to manage his creation. And that was the, the charge that he, he gave to the human being. You can take whatever you want over here with a particular prohibition, and supposedly from there on, we are living through suffering. Uh, enough have we heard about oh, the beginning of the struggle of the Christians, but we, uh, that is really important to understand. I'm not going to talk about that because Alana made a great presentation about that historical part, but I want to mention that a person who probably was like us and Henry George thinking in fundamental things like what grants the exclusive right to land uh, to some groups of individuals. And that was young Herbert Spencer. In 1850, he was thinking about that. And the most important thing for me about that is that he was looking for a fix principle, something that is not going to change, but can be uh, derived always, all the time, that idea of what grants us right. And that was from the 
uh, principle of that every man has the right to do whatever he wants, providing not infringing the other equal right of the other men. We are free to do whatever we please, but until we get in front of the obstacle of the equal right of individuals, other human beings like us. But that, from that principle, the right uh, is a deduction of the really man rights, the right to himself, right of freedom and liberty, and the right uh, to use the land. So it is really conclusive that in order to maintain and sustain our our self or as a human being and to reproduce, it's necessary to have access to the land. He didn't say that that principle uh, ensured to the human being the right to appropriation, but the right to access in equal terms, the right to use the land. It said that then we have to separate how we can exercise that right. But for me, it's very important to understand the, exactly the same, the term right. In English, and you can have noticed already, not difficult, that English is not my first language, but in all language that you want, rights signify exactly the same, right? And it's almost, uh, similar, drag, derecho, direito, rex, giving the notion of a straight line. And you see straight line is imaginary. If I said I want to go to the exit door, and there is this whole bunch of tables over here, I cannot do this and try to traverse on top of the table. These are my obstacles, but I could go straight to the door. But curving or drawing an imaginary line to carry me to the door. And the notion of right of is a line in the mind of the human being. This is not my invention. Henry George expressed that when he said that in the street when we were walking, we keep a straight line, but skipping the people who is in front of us, so confronting us in the street. And it's true, you just have to think about it. Do not have to agree with me, but if, again, if you can prove difference, let me know, because that means that I have been teaching something that is wrong. Uh, the other thing, and this is a purpose why I'm speaking about these general terms and concepts, because being a representative of the United Nations, even the individuals that are solving the world problems, they do not understand us. And that makes a difference. If we can change that conversation, because right from, uh, for other, for some, a certain thing, and for others represent other things. The United Nations, now I have to mention also, uh, after speaking of already what is right, the definition of right, and before I move further, that walking around in a straight line is the need of the human being to pursue their purpose. They follow, to follow what they desire. They will find the way to a straightforward, to achieve. And uh, that is really important because uh, that's the right over private, 
ownership of private property because we are owners of ourselves. We have the right to ourselves and also to the products of our labor. Uh, in real life now, I have been as a medical doctor, and again, my sec second element as why there is no accident is because I heard that Reverend is in the health issues, a health uh, program, you are a health professional. And uh, I have turned myself an advocate of uh, public health also. <laughs> but I'm a medical doctor. <coughs> But I said it's not a coincidence because he was talking about food, and food is the thing that is important in reality to exercise and to exercise a good health and to maintain and sustain a good health. So I'm not advocating to giving pills to nobody, but advocating for people to have a good job that can provide for them and really works to our peace of mind because when your spirit is not healthy, your body starts to get sick, okay? You don't have to believe me either, but, <laughs> but uh, we first our spirit and then we are part of, manifest in a physical body. So who's feel and Thing can do anything that our body we can manifest to the world to our <coughs> physical body is our spirit. So again, <coughs> challenge. If I'm wrong, just let me know. But the point that I I said that it wasn't a coincidence is because food security has become an issue, <coughs> and we propose to solve the world depriving people of the minimum that they require to nourish their body. So it's necessary to change that. There is this huge movement at the United Nations called the Urban Development Agenda 2030 that advocates <coughs> fundamentally nobody left behind. No one left behind by achieving 17 goals of pretension of eliminating poverty. And those 17 goals, I mentioned, and you can Google them, George's uh, ideas are in the foundation of them. One, two, three. Security, eliminating zero, uh, no poverty at all, zero hunger, and water, right? And we have uh, goal 15, which is uh, managing the land, land and justice. Uh, 15 is justice, peace and justice. And 17 has to do also with peace and justice. How we can achieve those goals if we're not assuring people the benefit of the minimum, okay? Some one of the uh, early presenters spoke, I think it was uh, uh, Mr. Avila mentioned how in every place where people has uh, retain line in their hands, it has become a, uh, it's through violence. It's not an easy process. And that opened to tell the story about the Garifuna people who looks like me, but uh, we've been declared as a ethnic group, indigenous people, uh, we have called, um, Human, uh, cultural heritage of humanity in 2001 because we have preserved from after 220 years, 21 years now, living in Central America, tradition all over cultural aspects 
and language fundamentally that represents in reality uh, the existence of of a civilization, a particular group. There are nine uh, there are nine tribes in Honduras, none recognized in the in the constitution, but the most important of them I could say is the Garifuna people because they are living in the north north coast in areas where the beach is fundamental for the developing uh, tourism and that has been uh, developed the, the struggle for us. They have been killing people, eviction, um, you name it, and expropriation in uh, aspect of uh, eviction of people in, in land grabbing. So what I'm doing uh, is what I'm doing here, trying to touch the heart of my community because with development, they think that if they are professionals, they do no longer pertain to the core of the community in adopting rules outside of our own community, which is based in common, common uh, collective titles of land and common uh, determination of the life in these communities. Uh, one more minute. So with that, uh, I lay out the basis in, in how rights has to be internalized from the core and the heart of the people in order to move to make the change. No other change can be done if we do not start by changing ourselves and believing that we have rights, but you have rights, you have rights exactly the same and we can now interfere with the exercise of each other's right. Thank you. All right, our, our fourth and final speaker um, this afternoon is Reverend Yolanda Brown, who is a Minister of Economic Development, um, and she's been one for more than two decades, and she's parlayed her previous professional experience in banking, brokerage, and technology into a mission for empowerment and community development in Texas, Chicago, Washington, D.C., Philadelphia, New Jersey, and New York. Reverend Brown is the founding president and CEO of Amani's Quest Ministry, a faith-based community economic development organization whose mission is to, quote, arrest the trends of poverty by creating pathways to economic dignity. The ministries is centered on neighborhood development strategies and the innovations in workforce development. Reverend Brown is the senior pastor of the Center of Destiny Christian Fellowship, a Sabbath worship experience on a journey of becoming, uh, being, living, and breathing the purposes of God. A fourth generation Brooklynite, Reverend Brown currently lives and serves in New York City, where she was first introduced to the principles of Henry George economics in 2003. And her talk is going to be on land rights and work. I want to thank you so much for convening this conference. It is necessary for us to gather center court in order to share ideas and challenges and what it is that we need to do to move forward in the assignment that we're given. I'd like to thank Alana, also who thought it was not robbery to include my voice among the many voices, those who are of great scholarship, those who are on the front lines and in the trenches those who have prophetic voice of justice. So I thank you, because she never forgot me. Uh, we met some 12 years ago, I believe, and she will always reach back periodically just to check on, to see how I'm doing, to bring me up to speed on what's going on. She does a tremendous work. So let us put our hand together for Alana. It's interesting, when I was asked to participate in the assignment, I wasn't sure exactly where I fit. 
Um, oftentimes, I am moving in a different spirit, and some, it may be a little difficult to receive some of the things that I may have to share. But last night, we had the opportunity of engaging at a round table. In fact, when we were at dinner preparing to come together, the Earth Rights Institute, I saw exactly why it was that I was being honored to come along to participate. Because we each have a story, and someone made mention of the storytellers. You have a story, a story to tell of your community, and I have a story to tell of my community. But I want to first greet you as family. Why? Because when we greet each other as family, we diminish the whole spirit behind othering. Because when we talk about the situations and circumstances that are happening in the lives and the communities of so many, when we begin to see ourselves as true brothers and sisters, we know that othering has no place. Because what happens to one, in effect, <coughs> happens to all. And so I had to stay within an outline because I am a preacher. And so if I got on the floor, I would be walking the aisles, and I'd be laying hands on people with various other things, which is a way of encouraging. So I'm going to try to be true to my assignment and stay here on the pulpit, behind the podium. And where's my timekeeper? I, I, I need you. OK, great. Now, in my approach to life as a prophetic voice of justice, I am most comfortable when I can be informed by scripture. That's my foundation, that is my comfort zone. Because when I find scripture to support what it is that I am called to do, I am most comfortable even against the odds. Even when the assignment doesn't look like I have the qualifications or the resources, or if it looks like I am a small voice in a big pond, if I can find scripture where the spirit of creator speaks to me and says this is what you must do, I do it. So in the book of Jeremiah, the 29th chapter, the 7th verse, here it is, the children of Israel is going into captivity. And they were told, we talk about building community. One thing I want to do, I want to pause for a moment. The scripture is a set of principles. To whomever will find the nuggets, the wisdom, the pearls in it, and begin to lift it up and to apply it. So in Jeremiah 29 and 7, the children of Israel are going into captivity. But they were told in going, seek ye the welfare of the city. And when I came upon that about 20 years ago, it spoke volumes to me. Now for 20 years, I have been working it out, walking it out, and it's becoming clearer and clearer along the way. How many know that hindsight is 2020? <laughs> when you've come past a thing or through a thing, you can see so much clearer, right? But during the process, you begin to express and experience the things that you express. And in this particular scripture, it said to me, seek ye the welfare of the people, of the city. But that can only happen if the well-being of the people is first and foremost. That can only happen if the well-being, the well-being of the people is first and foremost. The human life, which is a broad issue, is all about relationship. Man's relationship to mankind, including to self. It can be very complicated. And while human life is morally constructed, it has to be in a place where we can unlock its complexities by allowing the complex to become simple. And this takes each and every one of us within our experiences and our scholarship. That's why it's important to have the convening in the form of a conference, a symposium, or, or likewise. And now, I like to liken some of the tasks and the things that I do. I am called oftentimes to give a scriptural lens to the various causes, be it uh, <laughs> social justice, be it uh, uh, prison reform, whatever the case may be, in those certain areas, I'm called to give a scriptural reference. Now, one of the things I always use, and I'm going to use this with this gathering of family here, this family reunion, and we're learning to meet more who will come along the way, and every time you have a family reunion, the next year there's someone who's new to the family, so we welcome each and every one of us. I like to liken the things that we do when we attack as a fortified city. And in this fortified city, there are 12 gates. 
I'm going somewhere. And the issues affecting those gates may be different from all others. And each one is assigned to a gate. The very shalom of that city is being affected. The very peace of that city is being affected. Its safety, its health, its scholarship, its justice, its equity and parity, its prosperity. It has all been compromised to benefit the few over the many. You got the picture? So at the end of the day, sometimes we have to come sit of court. We have to come out of our position, but make sure we keep it manned by someone. That's why we have to go out in twos, and we have to have teams. I like how Annie has joined in with Alana and the great things that they have done, and all those who are in our midst who are linking up with one another. Because when we do so, we can then come sit in court at the conference and begin to convene and find the best case practices. practices. Now, by no means, is this list of the things that affect the nature and the health of the city. By no means is it exhausted, for there are many elements that affect the living, the life, the liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, as complicated as it can be, we must begin somewhere. We must begin somewhere in our advocacy for the pursuit of human rights for all. Human rights for all. And I have to add that qualification because human rights sometimes can be an individual thing because we are part of humanity, right? But human rights for all. Human rights is all about the welfare of the city within the moral fabric of our being. Human rights is about the welfare of the city within the moral fabric of our being. As you can see, I have a tendency of speaking in metaphorical uh, or parables or similes, but so did Jesus, so I'm in good company. I do so in hopes of painting a picture that are not only leaves an indelible mark in your mind, but also your heart. One spoke earlier about the compassion, the compassion that's needed. Many of us are driven by the passion to making a difference, which informs our scholarship, which informs our engagement, and informs our commitment. But as I like to also take a moment here to go back to Alana, because it's always good when you have a pattern and example before you. I applaud those who are committed in their passions to live a life of advocacy, advocating reform. Reformation is so important, call it reimagination or what have you. It is critically necessary to move things forward. For the very process of reformation, in addressing the complexities of human rights is to reshape the elements, to reconstruct the simplicities in life so that we can have equity and justice for all. And I like to also say that this beautiful being with a vibrant commitment has had a wealth of experience, a bona fide disciple of the teachings of Henry George. When I hear Alana, I feel the heartbeat of Henry George. I see where it can be practical, where it can be applicable. And I thank God that I'm able to do so because of her experience. She has traveled far and wide in community, uh, governments, uh, NGOs, and various other tribal and other situations to understand <laughs> that we need to advocate for the building blocks of life, the equity and justice for all, to ensure life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So, let's look at my text. Got to have a text. I'm informed by scripture. <laughs> Life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness, workforce development, a moral imperative. We're going to go to the book of Matthew, the gospel according to Matthew. And we're going to look at the 20th chapter. It is at a paramount that we open up the book because it's in there. It's so much in there, and much of what Henry George has shared and spoken over the years, it's in there. It may not be coded in the way that we would be able to identify it, but today I said there was really no more that I needed. To come. I, need, I didn't need to come up here, because everything I have prepared to share has already been said. And I really could have just stayed right there in that corner, and I would have been fine with that. But to honor the call that was given to me, I said that I must do so. Okay, so in the 20th chapter, verse 1 
through 15. And I want scripture because I want you to understand where the basis of what we do come from. Much of our systems and structures that are working come from the structures within the Bible. It says, in the kingdom of heaven, it's like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. We're talking about work, right? And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. Again he went out to the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand you here all day idle? They said unto him, Because no man has hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall you receive. This is a book of principles. So let's lift the principles off of the text. Let's bring it outside of Christendom or Judaism. Let's bring it with the principles of human rights. And when I read this scripture and I came upon this scripture which informed our initiative of connecting the disconnect in the workforce development, I said that the kingdom principle of maximum employment is a kingdom principle. Maximum employment <coughs> is a moral imperative. Employment means being able to work for the things that we need, for the things that we want, is a kingdom principle. So anytime there's a disconnect for man's ability to have access to opportunity to work, there is a problem. But many gain on that problem, and that's where some of the problem lies. <laughs> it's just interesting how this all plays out. And I was told that when in life you're trying to recover a thing because it's been lost or seems to be obscured, you may have to go back to the place where it was lost or it was first encountered. So we go back to the beginning. Many have referred to the book of Genesis and what God had mandated. In chapter 2 of the book of Genesis, he told the man, he put him in the garden, in the garden placement. <coughs> a place of position, a place of right, because God, the sovereign God, put him there, right? And he said, I want you to tend to protect and to guard. Those are the responsibility. And what does that entail? That means working. You have to work the land for everything that you need. You have to work the land for everything that you do. Out of the land will come. And work was one of the first activities that man was given. He had to work in naming things. He had to work in identifying things. Work is a moral imperative. And why is it so? Because it is a must from God. So God has given us a must. We know that we have a right to it. Because God would not set us up in a situation and say, you must do this and you must do that if you don't have that right. So you go in the name of God. Remember years, years ago, even before I was born, there was a thing about the law. The, the, uh, the enforcement agency. You know, say, stop in the name of the Lord. Stop in the name of the Lord. The one who has the power and the authority in the name of the Lord. So when God has given you a command, you have a right to pursue life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that starts with man's work. Why? Because man also finds significance there. We see that work is one of the earliest activities. And as assignment given to man, that who had to work, we work so that the availability of the things that we need would be there so we can share with community. Working was man's way of fulfilling man's purpose. So when they're separated, now God worked Adam so that he did it all for others. They worked, they lived from that which they received, the sustenance and the raw materials and creating community and building kingdom. Solomon said, that it is good for you to work, eat, and play. And he said to it, the prophetic instructions in the book, they give us instructions on correction when we have gotten out of the way. The prophetic books tell you about all those who were not taking care of the poor, the widows, and those who were on the margins, right? They also give us direction on what to do when we find ourselves being moved forward into situation, whether in a good situation or in a captive situation, but make the best of it. So the prophetic book, we see that there's so much that's talked about the laborers. 
And God is a God to the laborer. He hears the cry when the wages are not what they need to be. He hears the cry when the wages are confiscated from those who are in the margin. In Romans chapter 4 and 4 and James 5 and 4, it talks about the wages is not a charity thing. It is, it, is the pro, it is the reward for the productivity of the individual, and it's the individual that holds that. So we talk about land rights and work, and work is a human right. It's a moral imperative. Full employment is a principle of the kingdom. And the book of Deuteronomy, which is a reiteration of the article of the covenant, I implore you to go back to the basic. Go back and just revisit some of the text. But in the book of Deuteronomy, it tells you how the land would be managed. There were those who made reference to that, but there was advocacy that's gone on. There was a woman, there was a group of women. Their father had died, so there was land that was due to their father, and they wanted to go back to the nation. And these women, in a voice of advocacy, looking for fairness and justice, they said, well, because our father didn't have any sons, why should we not have the inheritance? Because they too are thinking about their prosperity, posterity. Because that's where the prophet goes to the posterity, so that everybody can have what they need. And they began to speak, and they spoke justice, they spoke fairness. And the man of God, Moses, consulted God, the owner. It's about ownership, stewardship, accountability, and reward. He spoke to the owner, he said, what they're asking is a good thing. So we can see the connection without work. Man is, without work, man is, fill in the blank. Without work, man is, so work is a more imperative. In fact, work may even become a little bit before land rights because you got to be able to work the land. And whether you own it or someone else owns it, you still got to be able to work because it's so key. And that's why I really believe as much as they have abolished slavery, they never outlawed it. That's why it comes up in different disguise now, be it the prison industrial complex and various other things. Just last week, there was a major strike against the wages, against the abuse of laborers who own their productivity in the prison system, who are making about 10 corporations rich and profitable. That's where the problem happens. And we have that problem because the first principle is work. Whether implicit or explicit, man must work. The wealth of a nation is in the wisdom of its produce. Wisdom is the beginning of all wealth. So with all of our getting, we want to get an understanding. The Bible, the scripture also said, it is God who gives us the power to get work by working. So don't deny anyone the opportunity to work. And the high unemployment, double digit unemployment, Bernie Sanders brought that to the light, but people didn't want to believe us. We were advocating for our community. How double-digit unemployment is prevalent within the black and brown communities. They're closed down the opportunities, giving them no skills. So there's no place for them to go, so they stand idly. They don't have that landlord that comes along and says, come, I'm going to give you opportunity to work. So then what happens? Lawlessness and everything else sets in. Land rights, the right to work. Human rights is a moral imperative because it's all about life, the liberty to pursue the happiness for which we are created. Seeking the welfare of the city, that's what we're called to do. But it starts with the well-being of its people. Thank you, family. Some of the churches that you're working with, and your, your church is one of them, are you also some churches with a little little bit of land that you're allocating for the gardening? So we have churches that have um, individual gardens on the church property, and so those churches are, are growing the food and they're giving it to the people um, 
on on Sundays or on Wednesdays, whatever day they decide to do so. Um, but then we have the big farm where we're growing in mass and we're selling um, to the public and to restaurants and so forth. Now, Reverend Brown just talked about work and people are working these lands. So could you talk about what they're learning and their experience and feelings about growing food? Yeah, sure. So for us, the uh, the farm, the farm, so the gardens that people are using, we, would, we, would, we put those gardens there so people would learn how to grow their own food and hopefully learn a, um, an affinity for foods that they wouldn't ordinarily eat. Um, for the large farm, that was originally conceived as a um, kind of like a workforce development program. It's, it's, it's intended to employ returning citizens from incarceration um, who are looking for work, can't find work, or the work that they do find is not dignified, not dignifying. Um, so we, we created the farm in part to hire them so that they would have a place where they could um, spend their time and, and, and hone their skills. Well, I just want to acknowledge you for the work that you're doing because not only is it an empowering community, but it's also building the wealth of community. And there really isn't much more that I need to say on the things that you've shared, continuing the way that you're going. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. To that point, I will say, so when we originally conceived of the farm, we thought we were going to make money. We thought, oh, the farm is going to make money, it's going to be profitable. and then after being in, involved for a few seasons, we're realizing that um, running a farm for profit is really hard, <laughs> especially if you are not employing professional farmers, but you're employing people that you're trying to hone for, like you're trying to teach them a skill, and um, you're kind of working with people and trying to teach them about you know, work ethics and so forth. So um, you know, we, we run you know, about 60, 70% of our budget comes from donations. And then the 30% is from sales, which we're hoping to make that at least 50-50, but that's not the way it is now. So um, we're still discussing, but you have to go. But I really, did you, and I want to make sure before you scatter out to the outside here that you meet maybe with Courtney when you pass through the door. Courtney Dow, who's project manager for 67 Acre Community Land Trust, just starting up in Virginia, uh, Western Virginia that's working with people returning from prison. The same seems very similar to what you're doing. So a little networking suggested between you two. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. For how long you have been doing uh, this uh, agricultural process and how you feel that the response on behalf of the workers has improved in their a spiritual uh, way of career. So, um, so the farm, is, the farm has been exist in existence since um, 2013. The farm um, came into existence. I started working on ag on health agricultural related projects in 2011 when I graduated from Divinity School. I went to South Sudan for 18 months. And um, there is where I really, my, my eyes really got open to the importance of agriculture and the integration that scripture, we integrate scripture with um, agriculture, with health, with the everyday learning. Um, um, South Sudan really taught me how to do that. And then I brought some of those lessons back. Um, to the wow, fantastic. Thank you. Now, you, you may mention that you were uh, participating in a health conference and understanding that food is our best source of health. Is there anything for, that you anticipate on get, getting from that conference, receiving from that conference, that's going to help you further the work that you're doing? Sure. I'm going to switch mic because this one doesn't work. This one's not working. Yeah. So, um, there's a conference that I'm going to, I'm going to facilitate and to um, talk to uh, a, a group of churches um, from New York and try to motivate them to do some of the things that we're already doing. But whenever I speak, one of the great things that I'm always hoping that people would offer up is support. And in terms of networks, in the terms of finances or 
connections with foundations with um, do-gooders um, with people who have land and so that um, I mean there's a whole network of people who are who are considering these things that we're I'm friends with who need land in Virginia and in Pennsylvania and DC and their 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 ability to be effective is hampered because they don't have access to land so when I go to conferences and I meet people from around the US and um, if they are so moved to say, my church can give this land, or my in, as an individual, I can offer up this piece of land, then that's something that um, is well received, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, um, since you're going to New York, I would really love to work with churches. Part of my work right now with the Garifuna people are with churches who are dealing with immigration and because that people came, those people came from communities, rural communities, uh, they've been forced to leave their land. Uh, what I would really like to be connected in, and to learn a little more of the experience because modernity has uh, pushed my people to think that they have to come and uh, abandon their own lands and uh, disconnect of the agriculture that is part of their life. Right, right. Yeah, yeah I'm, sorry to hear, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. But we can talk. I'll give you my card and we can talk. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I have any recommendations. I have a question, though. Okay. I would like to know about um, your workforce development program. What what does that look like, and who like who, who's involved and who's who's learning? The program itself is under under design, but we started uh, two years ago with the um, idea that connecting the disconnect. We feel that industry is disconnected from the people. In other words, since the school itself has done away with trades and skills and various other things that would have given people basic tools for employment, that industry themselves had a greater role and, and, and responsibility to training their workforce. So we've been speaking, we had a 20 person round table talking just the idea of what is workforce development. Now it's amazing the different feedbacks and thoughts that we got on that whole idea but the whole idea was developing the people to do the work, giving them the skills, but more importantly, giving them the opportunity, because sometimes the opportunity access comes along. So after that, what we did, we have a symposium, and that symposium was bringing in industry themselves. We're talking about private, uh, public, uh, non-government and various others to make the case that there's a ne necessary for them to be at the table. So we're looking at to find ways of creating a training center or advocating that someone else does it. We don't have to be everything to everyone else, right? But supporting someone else so that the industry, they will basically be part of the pipeline. The organization will develop the skills based upon what the industry say they need. Oftentimes, in trying to help industry out or to help a community, people go in to approach uh, situations with what they think is best. Never once really asking the community or the industry, what do you need? So we're looking at connecting industry to the workforce letting them know that it is as much as their responsibility to develop that workforce because without the workforce they don't get the contracts. Okay, thank you. Mine to my sister Kizia. Um, being that you're Honduran originally and still very connected through family and friends and interest in Honduras, knowing that this topic of the dominium of the land grabbing and that our United States foreign policy is based on full spectrum domination of everyone everywhere else on land, sea, and outer space. The opposite of the koina that we're talking about today. <coughs> Having watched your country in the last few years, what, what can you tell us about the relationship of our U United States and what has been happening to your people there? Okay. It's, it's very deep. 
requirement to answer to that, but I will try to give a, a, a glimpse of uh, respond the more direct that I can about that. First, that we have the hands of the United States directly in the in the issues of Honduras. Uh, recently, starting by um, 1998, after the Hurricane Mitch, natural disaster opened the opportunity for make changes and for land officially and institutionalize land grabbing. The government proposed to eliminate an article in the Constitution that prohibit initially to send land in the coastal area to foreigners. Uh, we start opposing, but finally they turn around that article of the Constitution and I said that they build thousand small article 107 to by little pieces give the, the turn, you know? So they changed uh, many laws, uh, put laws that uh, change the life of the people, relocating the areas where they suffer the most after the hurricane beach. And people emigrated, and here we are 20 years after the hurricane with a status of a special protection, TPS, and recently Donald Trump, uh, the president, has uh, finished, terminated the, the agreement. So the communities start to panic because what they're gonna do, they don't have status. If they don't have a way to, to legalize, they will be in sent after 20 years. So talking about rights, why you have people living or temporary uh, if they be, become productive to this country and to Honduras because in those 20 years uh, the uh, the gross uh, internal products of Honduras come from remittance. The people who were here, it was sending money and that was moving the economy but then after, let's move forward 2009, there was the, the coup d'etat and that completely changed the history. And uh, it was Hillary uh, Clinton time. They validated the coup d'etat. They redefined the uh, concept of coup d'etat. They said that Honduras didn't happen. And they removed the president and put it in a plane in pajamas and sent it to Costa Rica. And it wasn't a coup d'etat. Maybe because they didn't kill the man. You know, that's the reason. So they changed it. And the other thing is that then they start, we have internal problems also, because people, Garifuna process, that are believing they are getting position with the government, they collaborate with the government, and they change uh, the uh, February, the government to take over with those changes and sell it. And also institutions like the World Bank, like the United Nations proceed because uh, in 2015 it was launched the decennial for African descendants to integrate uh, all the bronze people and those blacks that speak Spanish and other language, language to put together and say that they have to go to reparation in the United Nations, similar as a declaration for indigenous people. Now we have a declaration for Afro descendants. But in the case of the Garifuna Lana, to answer, finalize my answer, has been become prejudicial because of those traitors, Garifunas, has promoted with the government to uh, declare us Afro descendants and we are Garifuna. Garifuna is a term that is equivalent to Mayan, Azteca, Inca, and how are you gonna go and tell a person, you're no longer a Lana, you're an idiot. <laughs> you understand? It's exactly that what happened to us by decree. So in this precise moment, we are fighting that, but with the organization of the Americas, also they validate the recent uh, elections that it was totally fraud. Proved. And that also put us in danger. 
So institutions are playing a role in, in the land grabbing. notion of a maximum authority out there uh, grant us the humanity the rights to the use of the land. What promoted you to do this? I was born into a fundamentalist Christian conservative Republican rural Pennsylvania town. <laughs> and uh, I went through the uh, being born again, give your life to Jesus experience about the age of 10. It was very powerful, uh, coming from an evangel evangelical family. Uh, but then uh, when uh, it's, you only go to heaven through Jesus, I asked my mother, what about our wonderful Jewish doctor? He's not gonna go to heaven? That doesn't sound like a loving Jesus. And my mom never could answer that question. And I looked at the wars and the poverty in the world as I got older. And the answers to my questions weren't there in my United Brethren Church. I looked at the emotional issues that people had and the relationships within their family that were being covered up and they presented a nice face at church. And there was no recourse or way to find emotional healing in a fundamentalist Christian search. It's just give it all to Jesus. I was on a swimming team. YMCA swimming team, and, and uh, uh, I did pretty well, winning the races. But then the Catholic gals from the other teams were genuflecting so that God would be on their side. And everybody was praying to God that they would win. And that didn't make any sense to me. So pretty soon I questioned everything. And I really didn't know what to do. What was worth pouring my heart and soul into? And frankly, I didn't find any people that I could really talk to till I was about 25 or 24 years old. So I went on a long vision quest, I call it my 25 year vision quest from age 18 till I moved back home in 1990 with my big questions. What's the root causes of poverty, war? What is emotional healing? What is the relationship between our feelings, our mind and our spirit? What about the soul level? What about the eternal level? You know, big questions about inner and outer life. And I was drawn one way or the other, maybe through an inner guidance, and I would move to different cities to different places and different teachers where I could learn the answers to my questions. And one of the last great things was in my young 20s when I stumbled across a poster on Henry George, and I took a five-week class, and that answered all my economic type of questions. So then I came home, <laughs> and why am I, 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 I really think it's so important coming across Charles Avila's work a number of years ago, that we have an awakening. We all want this awakening to happen. We're all hoping and holding our breath and doing what we can. But we know when the, when the churches and the spiritual people awaken to some deep fundamental truths and justice, there can be great social change. We saw it in the civil rights movement when the churches get on board. And so to me, really showing that voila, churches and loving people in the churches, co-concerned about poverty. My parents were, and, and so many people, they give. You know, my mother would go wheels on wheels to the poor people, the poor people, older people in their houses that couldn't cook their food anymore. All these women doing these charitable works. So there's all this love and caring in the churches, in the communities. But there's no understanding of the basic justice in the Judeo-Christian tradition because it's just not being taught. So having this today was a, a way to ignite a spark on all of us and, 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 and seeing how we can become the kind of leaders that can keep bringing that spark out and help keep bringing our, our movement forward. Is that what you wanted to do? DPI conference at the United Nations, 
the public department of information of the United Nations, and they were celebrating social, civil society. Mostly who are enrolled in DPI, uh, Department of Public Information, are the organizations of civil society. And this, this, uh, this year, the topic was walk together through peace, walk together. And uh, in one of these conferences, uh, they were saying that the necessity, necessity of developing our consciousness in order to make those changes. So I ask the question, and I pose the question now to you, because they didn't answer. But I think we have the answer over here. But I think it's important to think about it, is we are going outside there to talk to the people, what will be the formula in, in about developing that consciousness that makes the people to, to strive to work towards the change from from the, 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 the own part. Yeah. Can you think about it? Mm, well, it's complex, and I, I alluded to that earlier, but because we have those who are, have the scholarship and the experiences in their projects, what we can do is help devise some type of campaign that would show the simplicity of it. I think about um, the new basic income. Uh, is he here today? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Stephen's approach to it was basically to make it personal, to engage and captivate the potential audience so that they can see themselves in it. Because oftentimes when I am far removed from understanding these things because I don't see where it applies to me or to anyone else that I may know. So we get to make it simple, simple so that people can really begin to see themselves or see the communities. Just like um, Courtney said, it wasn't until some years ago where she felt she really had a right to be. So I think in awakening that up, and then you know how it is when you stumble upon something that's really good, you know, good movie or a, a good piece of information, you seek to go out and you share it with someone else. So I think taking the complexity, as complex as they are, to break them down into simple, manageable, bite-sized bits will be able to pass that on to the succeeding generation. Um, I'm not getting any younger, and uh, most of us aren't either, unless you found the fountain of youth, but we have to think about succession. How do we begin to share this with others so that they get it? And the culture's changed, but the issues and the problems are still the same. Does that answer your question? Okay, so I just see the time is 3.28 to end at 3.30, a break of half hour, and then reconvene at four for opening the conversation. Maybe we want to form small groups, but as a moderator of this session, might you, Alex, please kind of close the session and, and uh, Sure, so the questions are not gonna come until four? Yeah, we're asking people to write questions to specific speakers on three by five cards. We'll, we'll get those cards to, to the speakers from the whole day, whoever's still here. Um, and, and we'll just see how that goes. I mean, we might even want to form small groups. What would you think of that? At 4 o'clock, we'll, we'll shake the next hour. How about that? Because people love the smaller groups you can really share with each other. How many would like to form small groups for part of the 4 to 5? Well, I don't see a lot of enthusiasm on that. So, okay. <laughs> so I guess to close, just if you have any questions for any of the speakers um, for the afternoon and, and also earlier in the day, take a note card. Um, and write your question to the speaker, and between four and five, we'll do our best to answer all of the questions. All right, thank you.
thing as well. Okay. Okay, I'm going to start a little bit here with some comments. And you, co you all can keep this in mind, this comment too. This is a question, general question. When do we begin to focus on enacting Henry George? Okay. Come to tomorrow's session, I think that's what Dan's really going to have a focus on. And uh, that's along the line of implementation. Um, someone's comment, I believe that Turgot, one of the physicrats, wrote his own treatise on political economy at the request of two Chinese students who had come to France to study. That's kind of fun. Here, uh, Dr. Dossie's card. There's a card for you, a question. Uh, for all, do you support farmers' markets and what can be done to reduce the deaths and complications of minority women uh, during childbirth? Well, it's two. It's do you support farmers' markets and then what oh, can be done to reduce the deaths and complications of the poor minority women during childbirth. And we know how high the infant mortality rate is, unfortunately, in low-income people. You want this one? Medical doctor will take that one. Whoops, sorry. Okay. No specific speaker, but do you have any sense of the impact of current taxes on the local poor workforce or their employers? Or for that matter, the effect of taxes on the cost of living for those that do not have jobs and are dependent upon charitable handouts. Since this is a jobs question, you can see, Yolanda, dear, if you have anything you might want to say to that. All right, so we've divvied up the cards and some other people from the audience want to ask questions, or I'm sorry, want to make comments. Uh, so I think we begin with you guys with your cards, whoever wants to start. There are four cards here, so to so pick them up one after another. Or, uh, That's always so a good plan. Like, uh, the first one, uh, is it fair to say all land titles originated at the point of a sword or muzzle of a gun? Not bad. I think uh, it's fair to say that. <laughs> when, when you go all the way to the origins, uh, that's what uh, the early church fathers were telling us. And uh, I think most uh, political economists now, historically serious, would agree with that. Because uh, the very nature of having so many lands was really just a phenomenon of, of land grabbing. Whether ultimately this was covered up by legalities, by whatever uh, legalistic or other kind of uh, cover-up might have been there. Does your powerful pe presentation of the early Christian views of ownership reverberate in the, the religious leaders you've contacted? Uh, yes, in fact, yes. Uh, I have influenced mainly Catholic bishops' conferences and also uh, conferences of uh, ecumenic, ecumenical conferences. At least from the point of view uh, of uh, putting out statements, uh, publishing statements. And that last one was not, not well, not, sometime back, even in the United States, when the USCC put, came up with their um, pastoral on U.S. capitalism. Uh, the archbishops told me that uh, everyone had a copy of this book that, uh, that I wrote. And they, they wrote me about it. I, and I later on read what they, what they read, uh, what they wrote. I, I think it, it had some influence. But could you explain why Later, our medieval Christians failed to follow the ideas of land ownership proposed by the 
by the early Christians. Yes, it's very simple. Um, uh, the church has become the biggest uh, landlord. <laughs> um, not overnight, but even during the time of persecution, uh, when they were already accumulating cemeteries and church lots and so many donations from uh, uh, even uh, richer members of the church. Um, of course, the practice in the beginning and for many, not only decades, but the first two centuries was sharing. But uh, it came to pass that uh, they thought it uh, were practical to imitate Roman organization, uh, Roman administration, and Roman law. <laughs> so before you know it, uh, like the whole world went uh, the way of, of Roman law. Roman law uh, appealed to the so-called practical or not so perfect part of our hearts. Uh, we explained it this morning what it was and it's really that. It's uh, the philosophy behind uh, many decisions of many courts. And so the struggle is to make explicit what is implicit, to really bring it out, to expose, to expose the, the evil of that kind of idea. Because uh, if the idea is not opposed, the you know, practices come from idea, institutions are brought about by practices, and you will have institutions that are based on something wrong. And the, the more you produce, the more wealth you produce. So this is where precisely I thought Henry George was a, a reincarnate uh, Old Testament prophet or early Christian writer, because he hit it right on the head. Uh, the more progress, the more poverty unless we address the very wrong idea of appropriating in private what should belong to all the governments. It's as simple as that. Really, as simple as that. The moment we attack them, then there's a chance for social justice. Because if justice <coughs> is, philosophically speaking anyway, ultimately, sum cubiques, it's Cicero, to each one is due. The question is, what is due to each one? <laughs> what, what really belongs to each one and what belongs to all? That, that's the challenge there. Now, later on, uh, to, answer, to answer this question uh, more completely, um, when the church became tired of the persecution and finally <laughs> with Constantine, and they had a breather, <laughs> in, in effect, uh, both East and West, the Eastern Roman Empire and the Western Roman Empire, I, it was looking into when they realized at the time of Pope St. Sylvester that Jesus was not about to come in the clouds uh, tomorrow, but maybe he has postponed the second coming, so he would say, <laughs> it's all right. Uh, let's uh, do a few other things that we, we need to do. And um, so let's forget the basics. That's what happened. They forgot Jesus Christ, who, by the way, himself was not a Christian, so it was okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, they just uh, built a church uh, on the basis of Roman organization and Roman law. And uh, they did a very good job of that up to now. Uh, the, I mean, the politics of uh, small countries like the Philippines is nothing compared to the politics of the Vatican. <laughs> uh, ultimately, it's uh, so so powerful an institution that has uh, come about. Of course, they are in trouble with the Pope that uh, wants to follow Jesus like this one now is. And lastly, is. Farming in the Philippines, labor intensive or capital intensive? How do farming techniques compare to the United States or Europe? 
Of course, our agriculture is not uh, modern. The Philippines is one country that uh, whose uh, progress was stopped, aborted by colonialism. We like to joke about it in that we say we were 400 years in the convent or under Spain, 40 years in Hollywood <laughs> or under America, four years in a concentration camp or under Japan. So that when we were finally born as a nation, we could not but be born free because imagine to be the illegitimate daughter of three mothers. Um, now, what happened was all the traditional values uh, we had, of what I explained earlier this morning about the, our very language, our very language, great language, that the one word ours in English or nuestro in uh, Espanol was distinguished very nicely in the, all the Philippine languages. I mean, and not in Amor or Apple, depending on which part of the country you have. Because they knew what could be, what, what you could appropriate justly. By the certain point, you had no right to, even if you could, even if you could own all the air, for example. Well, I mean, uh, it's, it's easy to talk about the land. But maybe give a ridiculous example. Supposing uh, you follow capitalist principles and say, oh, it's a market for air. Everybody, everybody is breathing. <laughs> and so uh, you pump in air every morning, put it in a tank until, until everybody else is unable to breathe because you have all the air cornered in your tank. And then at that point, you put up an advertisement saying, air for sale at uh, $20 per cubic foot. Uh, and uh, free, with free breathing for Virginia. One for men and one for women. Uh, I mean, you have no business yeah. taking the air in the first place. <coughs> now, all the elements of production, one has no business appropriating them in private. And once that is recognized by a massive consciousness, massive non-violence, worldwide, and at every country, every locality does that, then there is hope for the recognition of our oneness, for the recognition of our koinonia, as we were saying earlier, whatever language we use, pagkakaisa or unity. And I think, uh, the real politics of the people would have come about. Thank you. Is that it for Carl Dali? Yeah. I guess I'm next. There, there is, um, I just have one card. Many people are turned off by religion Many people are turned off by religion because they ask, how could a just God permit so much evil and injustice in the world? How do you and Henry George respond to this? I have one card, but I think they gave me the hardest question. <laughs> <laughs> I have an idea about Henry George, but um, I have a firmer idea about how I think about this. So, um, um, my, my thought parrots um, Augustine of Hippo's thought. Um, God created what was good, but also gave people choice, so we have free choice. And sometimes we don't choose what's good. And so Augustine of Hippo thought that 
evil is really an absence. So as darkness is the absence of light, and as death is the absence of life, um, evil is the absence of good. And I, I would push that a little bit further. I don't remember any passage where St. Augustine fully says this, but um, I would say that evil, in my own theological way of thinking, is pushing that intuition for the divine that all of us have away from ourselves. So it's an absence. and um, But it's coming from the good gift of choice. So we're, we're more than more than puppets. Um, Augustine thought of the center of evil as being pride. That is, you're turning to yourself away from God. So when you're looking at yourself, that to me is fairly close to where Henry George was in one passage. I don't remember exactly where it was, but I could look it up and some of you will know this off the tip of your head. Yes. But where Henry George says that uh, evil is like greed. So he equated it with greed. St. August, Augustine pride turning inwardly. I think they're both pointing to something very similar. Um, I think pride is a broader term. And I, I tend to, to like, like that term. Um, uh, as a final part to this answer, I would just say that in my theology, I think that there are many things we don't understand. People are fallible. And so we're, our minds can comprehend a lot. It's always a process of discovery. And I found this as I've aged too, that there are things that I understood at one point, I understand a little better now and I think a little deeper. And um, that sometimes it goes the other way, doesn't it? But uh, it's a process of understanding. But uh, I, I tend to hold the Christian belief that we don't understand fully. I have the hope that we'll understand better at some point. Good afternoon. Um, I have a couple of questions here. I don't know if I'm being punished or what, but uh, <laughs> I'll do my best um, to address the questions um, in that I'm a student of life forever, disciple. I don't know everything. I know some things, okay? So the first thing we have is ethical challenge. The need to develop consciousness or remove the obstacle to consciousness. That is the question. And as I ponder the question, um, I will give you an answer from my own experience. That's all I can speak of is my experience. And if you choose to go down the path that I have gone, you may find that to be true for you and maybe not. But remember, it is my experience and my response. In no way am I imposing it upon you but since I'm asked the question, am I free to answer it? Yes. Okay, great. So the need to develop consciousness or to remove the obstacle to consciousness, I think is a paradox in there in that um, the need to develop consciousness is with self, connecting self with the source of creation, however you want to determine it to be or remove the obstacle to self, or obstacle to consciousness, is removing the obstacle of self, removing the obstacle of ego, meaning that we have to determine the outcome, that we have to determine it all, and be like a child who has this awesome um, uh, wonder of discovering. And discovering is maybe trying some things that we haven't tried before. And if it didn't work, try something different, but there's something outside of ourselves that are within ourselves. However you want to explain it, it's there. We may not be able to fully understand it, but it is in the process of discovering 
that we give ourselves permission, wanting to know what's on the other side of the door, what's between us and what's on, on the other side of the door, is moving self out of the way and moving forward with that which is pulling us. So I would like to say start with self as either removing self or giving self permission to go forward, okay? Now the second question is, again, remember I'm just answering these questions from my perspective. I am a student of life, forever disciple. I don't know everything, but I know something, all right? Now in this age of quantum physics, I see the reliance on the concept of God not to be a declaration of faith, but a means to invoke our common ownership or stewardship of the natural environment, earth, and our common dependencies on opportunities for sustenance and abundance. Could you make your argument for common ownership of earth without resorting to your Christian Semitic God? I can't. <laughs> that's who I am that's what informs me so then that means that I'm being asked to be like you are whoever you are but I am me and what works for me works for me to be informed by scripture works for me it gave me the permission and the license to go beyond the things that I was told and to begin to experience God much of what I read and what I have shared I share from experience. Having experienced God, I remember I was um, a, a seeker of sorts, and I have gone many pathways trying to get an understanding on life, on beingness. And there were some things that I came upon, you know, some different um, indigenous teaching and various other things that I began looking at. And I was at peace with that. And then I was in the park one day in 1998 and God said that I was then my next move was to join a church and I didn't have anything against the church you know I didn't know much about the church I didn't grow up in a church I don't want to say the church because the church to me is a church state but a church and an assembly a congregation of people I did not grow up with that so given all the things that God has shared with me I was a little concerned on how was I going to fit into this process? How was I going to take what was shared with me? And he said, I will give you, I will teach you the language because it's all in my word. That's when I became a student of the scripture, living the scriptures, living it in such a way to experience it. So all of what I share with you is my experience. Does that make it absolute for everyone? Probably not, but in most cases it will. So. I can only give you what I know from the, uh, re by resorting to, I won't say Christian Semitic, as our brother said, you know, Christ wasn't, a Jesus was not a Christian. Christian was a concept that came later on, in fact, it was derogatory uh, of identifying the other. It was one of those otherings, but we know that God can take the simple things and make make them make them palatable and uh, applicable to life but i have to look at the scriptures and scripture speaks to me so my invitation to whomever asked this question or anyone who may be holding a similar question is give it a try how many drivers do we have in the in the room who drive vehicles okay how many drivers have insurance okay and we have insurance, why? Just in case we are in an accident, right? But is it guaranteed that we're going to be in an accident? No, but just in case we want to cover ourselves. But what if just in case Henry George and many of us who are formed by our faith, just in case we have something that we can share with you, wouldn't you like to get some insurance? Wouldn't you like to take the step forward and at least discover for yourself? I find that many of my students regurgitate what they've heard. Many of them have not gone to the book itself. And when given the invitation to go to the book and try my best to make it simple, do you know most of them come back and say, we didn't know that was in there. 
and they began to see the power in the written word and how it can affect one's, one's, one's being. So quantum physics, quantum, in this realm of quantum physics as it was open, there's nothing new under the sun. Solomon said that everything that is, was, and everything will be, um, is. So we know that quantum physics just didn't start now because now it's begin. it has a highlight. In fact, quantum physics speaks to what we have conceptualized as God. A force and an energy that's beyond ourselves that's holding all things together. We believe in the dynamics of the atom, right? And all of its molecules and things are holding it together. Could it be? Just in case, get some insurance, okay? Now the last one is, um, to no specific speaker, do you have any sense of the impact of current taxes on the local poor workforce or their employers? Or for that matter, the effect of taxes on the course of living for those that do not have jobs or dependent upon charity handouts? Well, my last visit, that those who don't have jobs or, um, uh, ch uh, or depend upon a charity handouts or entitlement programs, they're usually exempt from the formal taxation as relates to income. And in most cases, they may not be property holders, so they may not have to incur property tax. There are sales taxes and various other things. Some taxes we do need because there's services that we need to provide for the common good. Now, as it relates to the impact itself of current taxes, there is a great impact because there is, in workforce, and, and, and I think Henry George had made uh, a, a case on this, why it was not fair to tax the result of one's labor and that's income tax, right? Because it didn't have the greater effect. I think one of the biggest problems with the economics that we subscribe to usually is land, labor, and capital, is the fact that those who hold the land are willing to pay whatever cost for the capital and not pay the cost for the labor. If we would in turn hold the land, I'm not saying that we should do that, you know, where it's out, out of speculation for the common good, but let's say we, we, we uh, rearrange that equation. Having the land and be willing to pay the fair value for the labor, that will increase one's, ab increase one's ability to have access to capital because the production will be increased. The problem, I believe, in the case of taxation and the imbalance is because, number one, we're willing to pay whatever cost it is for capital when it's misappropriated and should be willing to pay whatever price for labor. Thank you. Uh, I just want to add it a little more to what Yolanda answer to the last question on jobs, taxation, and that. It's important to uh, remember that Henry George's remedy is about making the land a common property. Why? Because he explained that not necessarily we have to take back the land because it's Im impossible going years back to find the correct owner of the owner of the land. But it's important to make it common in the sense that who holds the land uh, return the portion that depends directly to the land, that is the return to the land, the rent of the land, because that belongs to everybody. So in that case, whatever job you're doing, whatever uh, payment you receiving will be ameliorated for the resources share from the rent of the land. And actual life now, we see that the people who pay the most higher taxes are the regular people, the workers. Any deduction, any whatever, goes indirectly to the salary to the wages of the people. The people pay that. But you know, 
The same people do not do not understand that. They need to learn about Henry George. <laughs> and um, that's, I would like to add it. I wanted to add it on behalf of that question because that's the reason why we should be uh, engaging workers and understand the condition of the labor and why they are living in economic slavery. Okay? Well, I have three questions, and one I will share it. And Professor, I think if you want to jump in, in that you can do so because it's very interesting. Uh, 20 of the presenters, Thomas <coughs> Jefferson produced his own edited, edited version of scriptures parenthesis, Old and New Testament. Was such an effort useful in order to identify what is truthful in the scriptures from what is merely an imposition of cultural and moral relativism? Sound familiar? <laughs> uh, I think you like to, to answer or? Well, if he's reading that, I will answer my way. One of the thing is that the uh, Bible, Old and New Testament, <coughs> is a holy book for many, invalid to others. So what I know personally is that the Old Testament was produced to the before Christ and was applied to the before Christ, and the New Testament came to after uh, during the time of Jesus Christ to renew what has been twisted or wrong or the new chapter that becomes the new path of life for what Jesus Christ was coming to this world, to save us, okay, to serve. As a, as a vehicle of salvation. And he's talking about a spiritual salvation. So then, uh, if Thomas Jefferson had made his own version, uh, I don't think that it's added, adding anything for us because we have we, our own life and we are the one who are experiencing our own spiritual process in connection in this material life, and we have to come up and produce <coughs> our own understanding and way and code and principles which, which will guide our life. <coughs> so it's tricky. You don't have to accept my, my response, but I'm speaking because I grew up Jehovah Witness. My mom changed from Catholicism when I was five years old. And until 20, I was Jehovah Witness, but I have my criticism. But I appreciate still, and I guide myself with principles that I learned through the Bible. But I'm not crazy to uh, put handcuffs in myself for what the Bible says, because here's the thing, the relationship with God is personal. If you don't believe there is no God, doesn't matter, because God's gonna show you, or whatever first it is, it exists. So I don't fight religion. There is two things that I do, do not engage, is waste of energy, because I already understood that it's personal. What works for me might not work for you, because it's an act of faith. And if you, I was not there, uh, faith is expectation for things that you are sure that you will receive, but it's very just in that, you know? Nothing are sure, it's your energy. So why bother? So that is my second that, that question. If I, it, it, it's an interesting question. Um, uh, a number, number of years ago, I, uh, I purchased and read a book put out by the American Academy of Religion. 
that uh, w was entitled, I'm forgetting the name of the author now, but it was entitled uh, uh, The Bible in America. And I was very interested reading that particular book that by my 1900, so, so through the uh, 18th century, um, the, um, there were um, several hundred, um, I don't remember the exact number, but several hundred different translations of the Bible in America. And um, Noah's, Noah Webster's um, translation, version, version just another word for translation, of the, of the Bible, he thought when he did that, that that was his greatest accomplishment in what Noah Webster had done. He had taken all, all language that indicated some kind of sexuality, so he had removed sexual references from the Bible. He thought that was, that was tremendous. And these different Bibles have had different uh, directions. Now, I've, I've been interested in Bible translations. Many of the modern versions that are used by most major denominations are translated usually by committees and uh, scholarly, scholarly work. And I, I myself was um, uh, involved with, with one, 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 of, one of these. Um, and what I found is that every translation, every version of the Bible is culturally conditioned. So many times um, language is thoughts are placed into the Bible that uh, go beyond what the original text. So to give a quick quick example and uh, the Revised Standard Version, when it first first came out, uh, which was a, a update of the American Standard Version and uh, the English version of that, uh, and, and um, so it was it was a continual process of revision. But um, when that that came out, um, there was a tendency to translate the uh, a simple simple Hebrew word of. Uh, simply meaning father, you know. But actually, Av in Hebrew is more like ancestor. It can be father, it can be mother sometimes, if you get the drift. So the new, the, the new um, Revised Standard Version that came out updated that. It made the language more inclusive, which was getting back to, to what? we think was more like the original, right? And so every translation is time conditioned. I'd say something further as actually a Bible scholar. So most of my work has been in biblical, biblical studies. Um, that um, there are many things in the Bible that were time conditioned, applied to the ancient world. It was the way, what, what you have in my estimation in the Bible or it's the Word of God, but it's filtered through uh, humans. And so there are things sometimes that are discordant. You know, there, there, there's a passage in, in Joel about, um, well, we're, we're going to get after our enemies and such. And um, you got Isaiah. Isaiah, we're going to uh, beat those swords into... And the, and the flower sheds, right? So it goes the opposite way. Or if you think of Ezra in the Bible and Nehemiah, there, there are passages about, um, well, we want a pure, a pure race, and we're going to, these Jews that had come into, back to Jerusalem after, after being exiled, were being asked, if you can imagine such a such a terrible thing, to put off their wives and their children that um, were considered illegitimate, and then you get a writing like Ruth that points out, well, here here is here is the great value of foreigners and our own heritage and how important they've been, and then the book of Ruth ends up by pointing out that she was the ancestress of the great King David, you know discordant. So, so you get different voices in the Bible. 
But what I'm going to agree with um, uh, Reverend Yolanda Brown, and what I'm going to agree with with um, Dr. Uh, Gonzalez. To me, if you read the Bible like Henry George did, from cover to cover, and you have this custom of re reading it continuously, you know, there's a certain essence there that you just can't get away from. And that essence certainly includes uh, justice. Thank you, each one of you, for taking it so deep. There were two more cards that actually were people asking to make their own comments. That was an interesting thing, asking for cards to, with questions, and then there's requests for others to make comments. I know you all like to talk, but I'm sorry about those requests for comments from you all. Just because the time is such as it is, it's about 5 o'clock, our ending time. And there is one, rem one remaining question that I thought would be great for each one of you. And uh, I'm going to read it twice and ask that you each take one minute. So you're going to condense your answer to one minute. And uh, how about then I stand there, I'll sit, and when the minute's up, I'll pop up. And then you'll know to go to the next person. Okay? Does that sound? All right. So here's your question. How do we go forward with the understanding the care that is needed to do our part in making a difference needed, making the difference needed to bring about Henry George's justice to the people. I'm going to read it again. How do we go forward with the understanding, the care that is needed to do our part in making a difference needed to bring about Henry George's justice to the people? Which end do we start at? Kizia? Yeah. Uh -huh. Start with you, with yourself. And for that, first of all, you have to understand who you are, what skills do you have, and what you can share with people, and how, to, how you can develop yourself 
in order to uh, be part of the change. Not only criticizing, but placing yourself in what you ambition and with your skill, how you can go about making those changes. Thank you. Um, the question was, how do we, first of all, we must understand the power in the collective, and that we have to network, we have to link up with those who are like minds. Come to mind, bring to mind my analogy of a fortified city with 12 gates. Find your gate, join the people at that gate, bring your gifts, your talents, and your passion, and help fight the fight at that gate. Because if we don't, we all lose. Uh, be involved, be committed, and use your talents. Yes. Great. I guess that's uh, the same answer as the others have been given. To change our thoughts, to change our mind, we will change our world. And uh, if we do this consistently, wherever we are, um, to find the real, the real locus of change in our hearts and translate it into people's organizing, people's bonding. Get together a real unity rather than separation rather than alienation, but getting more people united on what they have discovered to be important to bring about the new order or the new dispensation that we all desire based on a concept of having that will give us well-being. I think uh, we just have to persevere. Do it every day, wherever we are. Thank you. There may be some people that wanted to go see. Well, where we could thank you is that we've got our book, book um, selection there. If you would each like to choose a book, and that's complimentary from, from us, and, um, and, and we really appreciate, appreciate you taking the time. And, and I'm quite sure the conversation will carry on. I've got a couple of comments from, from a guest that I'll, 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 I'll tell, tell you about, okay?